Hey trumpet nerds, welcome back to John Talks Trumpet. This week, I'll be talking about 10 super common mouthpiece mistakes that trumpet players should avoid. Anybody who knows me knows that I love looking at, talking about, and buying mouthpieces. But I've also made a ton of mistakes buying, playing, selling, and modifying mouthpieces. Here are 10 things I've learned. Mistake number one is thinking that what mouthpiece you play doesn't matter. This is totally not true, actually. The rim and the way it interacts with your face and your embouchure have a big effect on how comfortable it is to play and produce sound on the instrument. The sound concept that you can fulfill, your flexibility, your articulation, the ease of playing in the high or low registers, all those things can be affected by which mouthpiece you're actually playing. So depending on what your job needs are and what your studying and school needs are, a different mouthpiece can actually help you achieve your goals. Mistake number two is the flip side of that, which is thinking that a new mouthpiece can solve all of your problems. This is also not the case. A new mouthpiece will always have some kind of trade-off. If you're getting a little bit more endurance, maybe you're losing a little bit of sound quality. If you get a little bit more high register, you might lose a little bit of your low register. You get a little bit extra clarity of sound, you might lose some flexibility. Really, every time that you change mouthpieces, you are making a deal basically with yourself, that you are willing to take one thing over another. If your fundamentals and playing ability just aren't there, a new mouthpiece isn't really gonna bring that to you. There's no substitute for real practicing. Mistake number three is thinking that you need to go on a mouthpiece safari. When you're changing mouthpieces, you really should have a specific goal of what you're looking for in your new mouthpiece. Whether or not you want slightly more endurance, better high register, better low register, a little bit more clarity of sound, a little bit more clarity of articulation. You know, it can't just be like, hey, I'm searching in the jungle looking for a new thing. Like, it has to be more directional. You want to follow a treasure map, not just wander through the forest aimlessly. When you go on a mouthpiece safari, often a lot of your information is either coming from online forums or sensationalist mouthpiece marketing. Either way, you're not being told the full truth about those mouthpieces. Not because anybody's being purposefully deceitful, but rather because each mouthpiece and how it interacts with you is going to be particular to you. Another thing about mouthpiece safaris is that it kind of encourages you to keep switching mouthpieces. The more often you switch mouthpieces, the harder your life is going to be. Mistake number four is modifying a mouthpiece that you already like. I have done this several times in my life. I've had a mouthpiece that I've had a lot of success on, and I'm thinking, you know, wouldn't it be nice if I just opened the throat a little bit and let a little bit more air through the mouthpiece? Guess what? Modifying that one aspect of the mouthpiece can throw the whole thing out of balance. Changing the throat size, it not only destroys the bottom of the mouthpiece curve going into the throat, but also it makes the throat itself longer, a longer cylindrical section before the backbore, which changes a few playing characteristics of the mouthpiece. So in a way, even though you thought you were only changing one aspect of it, it actually affected the balance of the whole mouthpiece. Mistake number five is a classic one, trying to use the same mouthpiece for everything that you do. Even though whatever mouthpiece that you play most of the time is clearly a good fit for you for most things, there are various musical styles that we have to play, and assuming that you can use that same mouthpiece to make all of those different things sound the way they're supposed to sound is misleading. Ideally, you want a mouthpiece that brings out the characteristics of the instrument that you're trying to play or the style that you're trying to play. So if you're playing, for example, rotary trumpet in the orchestra, yes, of course, you could just put in your regular trumpet mouthpiece. But if you want to bring out the rich, bold sound of the rotary trumpet, I actually prefer to use a European made rotary trumpet mouthpiece or a version of my park mouthpieces with a backboard that resembles one of those traditional European backboards. Okay, mistake number six is one that I've made several times, playing a mouthpiece that your teacher plays. It can be really tempting because our teachers are usually our primary sound concept and influence for a part of our lives. And so when we see what mouthpiece they're playing, we're like, wow, that must be one of the good ones. I wanna sound just like them. But the thing is, is that their mouthpiece was probably the result of a lot of experimentation and dialing in based on what sound concept they wanted and what arrangement they have of their teeth and like how their lips interact with the mouthpiece and what level of lip engagement they have in the mouthpiece, how much help they need controlling the pitch in certain registers. There's a lot of things that they've considered that you haven't quite yet. When I was in high school, I studied with a teacher who played a particular brand of mouthpieces that is known for having a pretty large throat and large back bore. I got the sound that I was expecting, but also I didn't know better. And so I thought I had kind of an endurance problem when I was in high school. And looking back, it's almost certainly just because of the size of mouthpiece and the type of mouthpiece that I was playing and not because of any inherent difficulty I had operating the instrument. 
Mistake number seven is one that is especially close to my heart. It took me way too long to realize I needed to wash my mouthpiece more regularly. I mean, can you imagine using a spoon to eat breakfast and then just putting it in a fabric case and then coming back tomorrow and then using the same spoon exactly the same way? <laughs> I mean, I really can't. It's kind of gross. I don't know why we do that with our mouthpieces. I actually have to wash my mouthpiece every day. Otherwise, I do get some little sores and pimples on my arm sure after a particularly hard practice session. I'm not sure why, I probably have extra sensitive skin, but it seems pretty clear to me that washing a mouthpiece every day is a good idea. Uh, it's not exactly the same thing as polishing the mouthpiece, which, you know, if you take it and you polish it with a polishing cloth, it'll look clean, but the active ingredients in the polish can actually be really bad for your skin. So definitely wash it with soap and water. Don't worry too much about the shininess of the mouthpiece. Make sure it is clean in the same way a spoon would be clean. Mistake number eight is selling a mouthpiece that was at one point your main mouthpiece. I, again, have learned this one the hard way a few times. I'll play a mouthpiece for six to eight months, and then, you know, I move on to something that's a little bit different or a little bit better or whatever for me. And then I'm like, oh, I don't need this anymore. And I'll sell it to help pay for new mouthpieces. But guess what? If it worked for you for a while, there might actually be a really good reason that it was working for you. And like people who collect and sell old cars, it's like almost always you sell one and then you're like, five years later, you're like, why did I sell that mouthpiece? I mean, I really liked how that one did X, Y, or Z, and all the mouthpieces I have now don't do that very well. It sometimes can just be educational to go back and visit those old mouthpieces and feel how you used to feel when playing the instrument. Mistake number nine is thinking that you can get used to anything. There's a difference between an adjustment period and feeling that a mouthpiece is not quite right for you. An adjustment period, usually, in my case, about two weeks, I'll pick up a new mouthpiece that I think will work better for me, and then I'll give it basically all my attention for about two weeks and then see how I feel. I'll, then at that point, after two weeks, I'll pick up the original mouthpiece and compare them back and forth a little bit so that I can actually hear and feel the difference for myself. If the trade-offs are not worth it, then I'll go back to the original mouthpiece. Mistake number 10, in my opinion, the most common is not having your friends or teacher help you with your mouthpiece search. Trumpet sound is really directional, so usually people are kind of far away when they hear it, maybe even up to 20, 30 feet away, up to 100 yards away, depending on the size of the concert hall. So the best thing you can do for yourself on a mouthpiece search is to have a few friends and maybe your teacher come and listen to you in a larger space and then do a blind test for them where maybe you know which mouthpiece you're playing, but they don't and play a few excerpts that show different things you might have to do with that particular mouthpiece and see which one they like better. You are biased by the feel and perception from behind the bell of the mouthpiece, and you're always going to be most biased towards the mouthpiece you're already comfortable with, which sometimes can deceive us into not choosing something that is really going in the right direction for us. In conclusion, mouthpieces are a highly individual subject. It really depends on what exactly you're doing and who you're doing it with. For me, as a section player, I often am thinking about what mouthpiece I'm playing in the context of how is the design helping me blend with the members of my section. If I was a principal player, then I would be thinking more about how can I project more easily and lead the orchestra with less effort, which might be a little bit different of a mouthpiece design. Thank you so much for joining me today on John Talks Trumpet. I love talking about mouthpieces and I really could go on all day, but I'll save the rest for another time. Please like and subscribe to see more nerdy trumpet content, new videos every Tuesday.